Hey there. A quick warning before we jump in. I want to let you know that in this episode, we will discuss sexual assault and we advise our listeners to practice discretion in tuning in. Welcome to the Get Together. It's our show about ordinary people building extraordinary communities. I'm your host, Bailey Richardson. I'm a partner at People & Company and a co-author of Get Together, How to Build a Community with Your People. And I'm Whitney Ogutu, a Get Together correspondent. In each episode of this podcast, we interview everyday people who have built extraordinary communities about just how they did it. How did they get the first people to show up? How did they grow to hundreds, maybe thousands of more members? Whitney, who did you choose to interview today? Today, we are talking to Onyango Otieno, founder of Nyumbani, an online safe space for men who've been sexually violated and abused. And tell me, you know, Whitney, what, what stood out to you? What did you learn from our conversation today with Onyango? Um, usually, communities have guidelines and structures set in place for new members interested in joining. What I found interesting is Onyango's approach of letting in the first members of the structuring process and having them decide how they like to run the community. I think it's important to hear and listen to your members, especially if you're looking to run a sensitive community such as Nyumbani, creates a very collective foundation for the community from the beginning. The other thing was the importance of checking and taking care of yourself as a community leader. This ensures that you're not projecting anything that's unwanted back to the community. Only by doing so can we better serve our communities. Lastly, the importance of building with. The people own the power to tell their own stories. They lead their path to their own healing. Of importance is providing them with room for reimagination and the tools and platform to heal on their own terms. A powerful reminder why we need to continue creating meaningful stories. I love to hear Anyango's story, Whitney. So thank you for bringing him to the podcast. And I think while he speaks a lot about the experience of being a man in Africa, it felt so universal what he's working on. So I'm excited to share the story with the listeners. You ready? Should we jump in? All right, let's go. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to be on the podcast, Donyango. We're super excited to have you on here. Um, so you're the founder and the and the co-lead of Nyumbani, an online safe space for men who've been sexually abused. Could you please tell us more about Nyumbani, you know, the online community you run and why it was important for you to create it? Well, it's interesting that um, actually the name, the name is Swahili for home. And um, I came up with it while the space already existed because I didn't know, you know what would I call this kind of space. I mean, I'm bringing men here together. It's the first time they're even meeting and stuff. But the motivation around it was especially um, around like the onset of COVID-19 around March, April over there. Um, we witnessed heightened sexual abuse cases um, and uh, the Ministry of Health in Kenya was reporting that between mid-March and about June, we had 5,000 rape cases. Mm-hmm. And so 70% of the victims or survivors were girls who were 18 years of age and going down. And then 5% of that number were men. You know, we have quite a bit of mechanisms in existence that um, tries to cater for that issue, but there's barely anything for men, you know. Um, so out of personal um, a personal ordeal that happened to me when I was 20 years old. Um, our housekeeper um, raped me. Um, and at the time, I didn't even know it was a violation because, I mean, my understanding of rape was somebody has to physically and violently pin you down somewhere and, you know, violate you. Um, but with time, I came to realize that even manipulation, even coercion, even there are so many other ways, um, you know, that rape could happen and we we do not know about them so from the simple fact that there were so many cases that were um that i came across during this time of covid that you know men were being sodomized and they were being um, sexually abused sometimes by older women around them or or even sometimes their partners um i felt it, it was time to sort of just begin a conversation around African masculinity, which I was already doing um, with a podcast. But this not, this time, I just wanted to open that space a little bit more, first by sharing my stories and helping many other boys and men come out, you know. Um, and that was just life-changing for most parts. 
could you tell me a bit more about why you believe that there were no resources for men? Uh, why didn't they exist? Well, first, it's, it begins with the, um, the social conditioning around who a man is supposed to be um, and the fact that um, men are generally expected to hold in a lot of pain. And so by that fact, they barely report when they get abused. They barely report when, you know, they're, they're going through pain or, you know, their bodies have been violated and all that. And I think from that alone, there are barely any existing structures that help violence issues. Um, um, even in the work um, around um, social justice that I've been doing, you find that when you talk to men around abuse, they find it difficult even to talk about it with fellow men. And most times it also contributes to the high suicide rates we've been um, witnessing, and I think even on a global scale. Um, but here it's, it's a little more intense. I got a story um, one time from somebody who reached out to me and he told me that he had been sodomized by his fellow friends, like friends he knew, and they also robbed him on that day. And he got so angry and mad that he hired people to go and kill them because he, first of all, he didn't even know that he could report to anybody. He didn't know where to go about that. He didn't think the police would believe him. Um, and he also feared the ridicule. So for him getting the revenge um, was his way of saying, these people will never do it to someone else. And, you know, and I'm like, I'm the first person he ever saw talk about um, male rape. So a lot of these issues are very sociocultural and, from that simple fact and the fact that also the way our governments are set up and the people who are policy makers they are it's very patriarchal and from that simple truth there um these guys know very little about sexual and reproductive health and rights they know very little about you know male abuse because for most parts the word rape when we talk about it we only think of it as uh, going one way that it's a man doing it to a woman and how come you overcame all the social pressures? Yeah. Curious, how did you have the courage to do that? Well, I, I had been, I'm a storyteller. I had been writing my stories of my life ever since I was, um, I think, this is 21, 22, when I got on social media, when social media was just becoming a bit more popular in Kenya. Um, and I, I was in campus then. And um, by that time, I couldn't go on with school because my parents couldn't afford my fees. So I used to go to school just to sit on the computer lab. And I taught myself how to blog. I taught my, I joined Twitter, I joined Facebook and all these social media pages. And so I started writing my experiences because I had so much to say because I grew up in a home that that really stifled my voice. And that, that silence was just too deafening for me. Um, so for me, finding online spaces where I could express myself was some kind of liberation. And, um, you know, ever since that time, I think I got opportunities to keep teaching myself around storytelling um, and online engagement over the, all these years. And it helped me understand psych the psychology of online users, you know, because social media is a lot. If you're not used to it, if you don't know how it works, and all these techniques, um, it can overwhelm you, you know. So for me, I think it's been more than, I think, 10 years now of doing online writing and social media and storytelling as well, both online and offline. So I understand all these dynamics. And um, also just because I'm a stubborn human being, I really, I believe in the power of like courage and people coming out to their stories because everybody's story is everybody's story is really valid, um, and the fact that people feel they cannot speak up about their own pain is my motivator because that's what I want to happen and that's my way of bringing change um, in the little space that I, I have influence in. You mentioned you have uh, twenty five members within the community. How did you get your you know your first members together? How did you hmm. bring them in? So I'll give a little background to that. Now, earlier in 2019, is it 2019? Yes, um, I, I just woke up one day and because I've been doing mental health advocacy for quite a while, 
um i put up a post on my social media pages that i'm being i'm beginning uh, a mental health support group that's gonna be online uh particularly on our whatsapp group and 200 people got back to me saying yo please we'd like to join so i i put up two pages like two groups that was like you know 100 100 people each and uh, you know just developed some basic community guidelines but for most parts i wanted these people to own the space and and r- run it the way they wanted to, they wanted it to run um and so i think that gave me a bit of um, an idea of how i would r- want to run a support group um but also beyond that because i had been doing community events for quite a while ever since 20 um, I've been managing people and managing um, a, a, a safe space was something that was not entirely new to me. So when I particularly wanted to begin um, a safe space for men, um, I did the same thing. I got online and I you know, made the call out and so people want, started reaching out. Um, and so that has also been like very... Like there's so many things I've been learning, especially around how men approach you when they need to talk to you, um, especially about something like that. Because first of all, it's mostly a very new area to them and they take a bit of time to even trust, you know, um, and because they, they, they live with the shame, they live with the fear, uh, the stigma is also really big in your everyday life. Um, so, I mean, one by one, they just kept coming, they kept coming and, um, you know, we just developed the space. And what shared activities do you partake um, with the members just to, you know, bring them together and give them a sense of, of belonging mm. and um, togetherness? Yes. Mm. So one thing is um, we have uh, these healing circles uh, that we use stories. So each person has usually their own day in the beginning first um, to just share um, you know what happened to them uh, for most of these people it was their first ever time to ever ever say um, their story and so they finally got a space to actually share that you know um, and I mean for that it's like it's the first step to somebody even, you know, um, getting free because for for most of them, it's it's like a, an internal wound which they've never really even managed or even known how to deal with it. Um, and the other thing, I, I have these tools which um, I help them that help with um, regulating their emotions, um, especially because most of them also are dealing with a lot of uh, post-traumatic stress and anxiety disorders and um, depression also. Um, self-esteem issues and all that. So we all, I also divide them into like peer groups where I give them um, things like assignments they go and do together. They come back, they report, and this is what I learned this time. This is what I learned that time. But the idea as I move forward is I want to create uh, physical wellness centers where now we could have physical places where we could actually sit and talk and probably even have them in a space just somewhere out far from town where we could, I could be with them for like a week or two weeks um, and you know we keep developing this program so it's, it's still very much work in progress um, but I said I have to start because I can't I can't wait until I get so much money to create a physical space because that's going to take forever. Uh, and just uh, diving into the operational basics, um, you know, building community is hard and it must be especially hard if there's a lot of stigmatization and fear of emasculation, um, you know, that's being directed towards the members. Um, is there anything you would recommend to fellow community builders who are gathering people, you know, around a topic that the rest of society may stigmatize? I think understanding the sensitivity of what you're dealing with is the first thing. Um you really have to understand the nature of your community because communities are very, very unique. They're very diverse. Um, You also have to have done your inner work. That's another very important point. Just so that you could also avoid projecting any... 
any issues that might affect the community in a way or another because everybody is coming there their walls they're guarded up you know they're in pain they're they're looking for healing they're looking for all these things so you you need to really have checked your emotions and for me i go through therapy a lot you know because i mean all these stories that i deal with almost every day and even outside the space because so many people reach out to me for so many things um i always need to check in with my emotions to know how am i doing doing where am i what do i need to change and things like that um just to to take care of myself which is something very important to me um but if if you're anywhere and you're trying to build up a community knowing the nature of the community knowing yourself is is very important um but mostly to create safety in all manner of ways possible and i think that's one of the um shortcomings most of us have because uh, of lack of capacity building um we still do not know what safety looks like in a safe space um because most of us actually have never even had one you know so it takes a lot of work it takes a lot of collaboration it takes a lot of understanding uh, and a lot of emotional intelligence as well i really like the point on you know also just taking care of, your, of yourself i think sometimes you get too caught up in trying to serve the members of our community um that we forget to take care of ourselves that we can better serve um the community as well so i like i like that um yeah. what have you learned about community building um in general you know just from running nyumbani oh that people are people are really powerful when they are given a chance to be themselves people are really powerful like you might find anybody like somebody you might see for the first time and you might think they don't have much to offer but the moment they are given safety and they are given space to exist in their full light they would amaze you and it just gives me an imagination of what kind of a country we can create if we keep dealing with um a lot of the internal traumas we may have some some of these traumas are communal some of them are tribal some of them are national some of them are continental they are on very different layers so i just keep imagining like if more people get access to healing if they get access to regulation of their bodies and emotions like how much more can we do with africa you know and if i see it in small bits in the i mean with the few people i work with it gives me so much hope that the work i'm doing makes some kind of sense and that people can be able to be productive with their own lives if they are given a chance to reimagine themselves being better um you also mentioned you host the podcast the afro masculinity podcast oh. could you share a little bit more about that project and how the podcast serves uh, nyumbani as a community hmm. so the, a little background about that um last year i was working with uh, an organization called green string network we were doing trauma healing circles for uh, uh some community members which um communities which had been exposed to a lot of violence and we are also partnering with the uh, kenya police um uh, for this trauma healing circle so we we, we would go to their uh colleges like uh, DCI or GSU or um Kiganjo where the the national police college is at and would have like this healing circles especially in the beginning with their facilitators just to have an understanding of who they are and the things they go through the nature of their work the syllabus they 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 have to go through and stuff like that um and again working with the police um the for, the the service has probably three quarter of the officers are men and so a lot of these stories would come out and you'd imagine so many of them still struggle with even how to express themselves they struggle with understanding how that system works because they, i mean they're they're working and um they're exposed to so much dehumanizing um working environments and um it just creates a very vicious cycle of violence because um a lot of a lot of how they operate also proliferates a lot of this um uh extrajudicial killings we are seeing a lot of the bribery a lot of the corruption and it's still connected to the grand corruption that is in government um and so it's a it's a very there's so many complex issues so in in hindsight i kept wondering i've always been curious about the african man because i mean my dad being violent the way he was when i was young um and uh coming from a polygamous home himself 
I had so many uncles. I mean, my grandpa had like, like 30 kids. And um, I mean, it was such a, it was like a city in a village. So we were so many people. And I mean, we were so many people, like sometimes I don't even know some of my cousins' names. Like we are so many. And I mean, growing in that kind of an environment, I witnessed so many things about how men behaved and about how women were treated. And I always, always questioned and there was nobody to tell me these issues. So when when COVID was beginning, um, I suffered a bit of an anxiety um, around early April over there. And I was like, now we couldn't do the college uh, workshops anymore because there was no more traveling. Um, so I sort of just resigned from the work and I said, I want to build up something um, different from uh, this trauma healing work, but on a different trajectory. Um, and so because there's barely, I mean, I've been working with a lot of um, and partnering with a lot of uh, feminist organizations for, for different activities. And I've always really just been almost jealous of how women organize, you know, the way they come together, they teach each other things, they, you know, they want to dismantle the patriarchy, they, they're working together in groups. But us guys have nothing. Us guys really have nothing. And I'm like, we continue being the problem because there's nothing happening around how we could understand ourselves as men. We go through so much violence from childhood and we do not know how these um, upbringings and social conditionings um, translate in our adult lives, you know? And so I was really curious about that. And so I wanted to start a podcast um, to actually delve into those issues internally and very, very explicitly, um, just so that the people around me, the men around who who would have um, like a curiosity to want to be better, to 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 be healthier as human beings, um, would have an idea of the things they could do. But also because we have very little understanding of who the African man is, you know, because for most parts, the African man exists almost just as a tool of labor. And that's one thing I also wanted to demystify. Where does that come from? What is it connected to? What is the historical underpinning of that? And how has it led us to where we are today, even as to contribute to a lot of the gender-based violence we witness? I'm getting so excited listening to you. <laughs> Such awesome work you're doing. And I don't know as much about the African man specifically, obviously, having never lived there, but it feels like work that should be happening everywhere. And yeah. I I just I remember someone once describing, you know, that feminism was in some ways uh the way that women come together to talk about the future that they want. You know, and and you need to talk about your current world to understand also mm. what, what might change and what could be better. But I realized when I read that, that I, uh, that, you know, the argument was sort of that men don't really have an equivalent and yeah. they, they aren't able to have sort of a, a container for discussing yeah. how men might evolve. And I think this work is, is so important uh, everywhere. So just, just saying I, as a comment, really, I, so glad you're doing it. Yeah, actually, um, one of the learnings I got was, you know, because understandably, um, women are way much more repressed um, globally. Uh, we do have more initiatives that, you know, try to get the girls and women to some kind of equilibrium with society. Um, but equally, like there's so many, especially black men who are down there and they are beaten up by how this, the, the system operates, how patriarchy itself operates. Um, and while women are actually doing nearly everything to topple the patriarchy, men also need to get in on the work, but they can't understand how that patriarchy itself um, oppresses them um, because they have this, I, um, you know, the way patriarchy is set up, it, it sort of... Um, gives an illusion to the man that it's benefiting them, but on the larger picture, it's actually still oppressing them. Um, and that one of the hardest challenges I've had is, I mean, we barely have any 
donor um, organizations um, in this kind of space. We have way much more in the feminist space, but there's not much funding coming to male programs because first of all, they are far in between, like they're barely even existing. And even in Africa, it's even just, it's like you can't even talk about it, you know. Yeah, but it's all interacting. And I think you do such a good job of explaining that, that if we ignore half of the population in the conversation about about gender and how we see ourselves, these dynamics are going to continue to play out. Um, and just to build on that point on, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges has been funding. Um, so what other challenge um, have you experienced from the time started running Nyumbani uh, to now, what other challenge has stood out to you worth highlighting? You know, the way, okay, I've worked with feminist organizations for quite a while and I love the networks they have. Um, that networking is such a huge component of development. It's a huge component of progress. Um, but because very few people have an understanding of African masculinity, you barely have enough people even to reach out to when it comes to the need for collaboration. For example, even when I'm reaching out to people like um, collaborations for psychotherapy, for example, um, who need to like understand these survivors, they are very far in between, including male therapists. They are very, very, like very, very few people get that. So, I mean, I mean, you, and the problem is huge. So that's like one of the other major challenges I'm having. Networking for me is really important. Um, and I'm trying to reach out even to like on a continental scale, like other like healthy masculinity advocates in the continent who, you know, are trying to do this work. And, you know, I think just connecting with them is, is another thing that, you know, I think could help us even develop a future of um, like, imagine what kind of a future the African male has. Has. But yeah, the, on the networking issue, that's that's a big thing because very few people understand this work. Looking into the future, um, what's what's a big dream for Nyombani? Where do you see Nyombani perhaps in the next five five years, five to ten years? Well, I'm seeing um, collaborations with government to create um, physical wellness centers. I want to have as many events as possible across the country. Um, talking to men about their lives. So, so far, um, because I've been doing like a crowdfunding um, thing, campaign, um, I've been able to, I wanted to also create like a, a visual episode uh, because visual is also really important. Um, and on it, I am talking to adolescent boys, to middle-aged boys, to older men on their stories and their lives because for me, that documentation is very important, especially for the men who will come after us who may not even still have those structures, but at least they will have the stories. At least it will give them some kind of direction and stuff. Um, but I'd love even to hold conferences around masculinity, you know, um, and, and uh, conferences that are in Africa around African masculinity. I'd love us to um, like sort of reimagine who we want to become just so that we don't we don't we don't just keep repeating what our our fathers and forefathers have been doing so i have no idea how that's going to happen but uh, my spirit feels very strongly about it that these things shall come to pass i hope all that comes to pass yeah. and um you know, what advice can you give to aspiring community leads, uh, you know, who are looking to bring people together, especially even just as we talked about earlier around, you know, topics that might be difficult, you know, to have in the public eye because, you know, we have to applaud you for the work you're doing because it's it's, it's not easy. Mm. It's a conversation that people tend to shy away from and, you know, would rather have in very closed settings. But what advice would you give to someone out there who's looking to start a similar community? The first thing is to understand yourself. You have to really know yourself. You really have to know who you are because you have to be very, very grounded. You have to be extremely grounded. You, like being grounded and centered is the first priority for this work. The second thing is read as much as you can about what you want to do. Talk to as many people as possible. Network, talk to as many people as possible about what you want to do. Um, because that gives you 
a bigger frame of mind to know what you're really getting into. Some people um, work with, you know, the emotion of, ah, this 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 is a brilliant idea. The, you just jump onto it and then in between it, you realize you didn't even have the proper tools to do the work. Um, and so I think my background in working with communities over the years, um, six, seven, eight, nine years now, has given me a very good background to know what I want to do with a space and how I can manage it and how I can manage myself through it. Um, and so, for example, you know, um, we, I, I have very few resources to, to read even about African masculinity. It's barely there. And um, a lot of the academic papers we have are also very extremely expensive. So I have to often, um, like, use my own money to get access to these, to these uh, materials so that I can even just read them and translate them into a podcast with my own content. It's a lot of work. So for me, I'm just, um, like, letting people know that in as much as it could be difficult, when you have the will, then it, the way the way presents itself, you know. So, self knowledge, self actualization, um, understand the space that you want to create, and work with people because you can never really do these things alone, not at all. Especially because it's not about you, but it's it's about the space you want to create. And the space, the space actually virtually means. The people own the power to their own stories. They lead the, 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 the path to their own healing. We are only supporting, you know, we are only helping with tools. We are only supporting with ideas. We are only like creating a room for, for their reimagination, you know. So again, you know, to, to remove yourself from the center, to, to actually to just decenter yourself from, you know, the highlight of what's happening inside there is very important. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I think one of the mantras that uh, people and company is uh, building with people as opposed to, you know, building for. So it's, it's, it's good to hear that uh, you're working together with your community just to create this safe space for them. And the room for reimagination. That's such a great phrase. I love that. It's beautiful. Um, so I know you're a mental health advocate as well. And so in what ways have you in all these community initiatives that you've been running and community activity that you've um, involved yourself in, um, in what ways has that also reflected in your work around mental health? And maybe perhaps even just speak a little bit more about on that. One of the things I'm really proud of is um, this advocacy has led to the amendment bill or the mental health amendment bill that's currently in parliament right now. Um, and uh, we've been lobbying for government to just create better policies that will eventually bring more public funds to mental health care in this country. On, on the larger scale, I'm imagining this thing happening for Africa where, you know, I was in Canada in 2019 and I was so jazzed by the organization around mental health care there, even though, yes, they were, they were not like very sufficient, but, you know, like there was a very good, almost national understanding of what mental health is and people talk about it and all that. Um, but here again, language barrier is a big thing because not everybody speaks English. Not everybody will understand what depression is or schizophrenia or anything else mental, you know, because uh, of these phrases we use. Um, and so what I'm excited about or have been excited about the mental health advocacy, it also gives us power to language because we can create um, these stories from from our own realities and come up with our own languages about what we are going through. Um, but I love the fact that I've gained so much friendship you know, and um, and love. I've met amazing people, some of whom were written off by their own families, written off by society that they wouldn't do much, you know, with their lives. And because I really relate with that, it's a, it's almost always a story of triumph because um, I've been part of trying to support people in building their own resilience. Um, and I think just with more advocacy and more lobbying, I mean, the future really looks bright. How can listeners, you know, interested in being part of, you know, Nyumbani reach out? Um, how can they be part of the community? Hmm. 
Um, so I think reaching out to me online would just be okay. Um, I am just found on Facebook as Onyango Otieno. Uh, my Instagram page reads Rick's Poet. Uh, I'm also Rick's Poet on Twitter. I'm currently not very active on Twitter because my account was restricted because I tweet so much about trauma. Um, so um, right now, Facebook and Instagram or even email is possible. So that goes like onyangohome at gmail.com. That's onyangohome at gmail.com. Um, I'm pretty much often, almost always online. So it's easy to reach out to me and we could always connect. All right. Thanks, Onyango. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And um, I wish we, we didn't all live so far away from each other so someday I can meet you. <laughs> but thank you for the work that you're doing. And maybe someday right. we'll cross paths. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. If you want to connect with Onyango, you can reach him at Rick's Poet. That's R-I-X-P-O-E-T on Twitter and Instagram. Onyango Otieno on Facebook. And Onyango Home at gmail.com. Thank you to our team. Thank you to Rosanna Carbon for engineering and editing, Greg David for his design work, and Katie O'Connell for marketing this episode. You can find out more about the work that Kevin, Kai, and I do as people and company, helping organizations get clearer on who their most important communities are and how to build with those people by heading to our website, peopleand.company. Also, if you want to start your own community or supercharge one you're already a part of, our handbook is here for you. Visit gettogetherbook.com to grab a copy. It's full of stories and learnings from conversations with community leaders like this one with Onyango. And last thing, if you don't mind, if you enjoyed this podcast, please review us or click subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It helps get these stories out to more people. Woohoo! Awesome. We'll see y'all next time.